Good evening to you all. And if you're in California, good morning. Um, my name is Patrick Murphy. I'm a senior fellow in the Institutes of International and European Affairs. Um, we have uh, a very uh, extraordinarily interesting uh, presentation this afternoon uh, by Professor Francis Fukuyama. Um, before we get on to this, um, you will allow me perhaps uh, to mention some uh, housekeeping uh, items. Uh, first of all, uh, the presentation by um, Frank Fukuyama it will be approximately 20 to 25 minutes, after which there will be uh, questions uh, and he will answer them. Uh, the whole event is on the record. Um, you are uh, invited to pose your questions by means of the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen and to uh, pose these questions at any time uh, during the event, that's to say, even while uh, Professor Fukuyama is speaking. Um, if you wish to um, tweet on this, uh, you can use the handle at IIEA. And finally, uh, the whole event is being uh, live streamed on YouTube. Uh, so much for the housekeeping. Um, I could say perhaps that um, uh, Professor Fukuyama is the last man that needs introduction uh, to anybody. Uh, he has for uh, 33 years been elaborating and presenting uh, the big ideas that uh, subtend our uh, political world. Um, and his uh, contributions have been extraordinarily fruitful and stimulating, uh, I say not least to me personally, um, I, I, lo I love these big ideas that uh, uh, Professor Fukuyama brings into the discussion. Um, the starting thesis of his um, presentation, Liberalism for the 21st Century, um, as given in his book, uh, Liber Liberalism and its Discontents, is that liberalism is under stress um, and under severe threat in the world today. Uh, this was said before uh, the event of the uh, 24th of February that we all have in mind. Uh, so one can imagine that it uh, can be seen as even under more stress today. Uh, so, Frank, you have the floor to make a presentation and welcome once again. Okay, thank you very much, Porter. I, I really appreciate the invitation by the IIEA to have me speak. I'm sorry that I can't be with you in person in Dublin, uh, maybe sometime in the future. So let me talk about um, one big idea, which is the idea of liberalism. I need to begin by defining what I mean by liberalism. It has a left of center meaning in the United States. It has a slightly right of center meaning in much of continental Europe. Uh, I have a broad definition of liberalism. Liberalism is a doctrine that was developed in the middle of the 17th century at the end of Europe's wars of religion, in which a number of early liberal thinkers basically said, we need to lower the uh, aspirations of politics, not to seek after the good life as defined by a particular religious doctrine, but simply to protect life itself uh, by cultivating a virtue of tolerance, whereby at that time Protestants and Catholics, but you know today maybe Russians and Ukrainians could live together uh, peacefully, um, allowing each to uh, individually choose you know, what to believe, what to speak, uh, and the like. Uh, it believes that all human beings are endowed with a certain basic level of um, dignity uh, that is equal among all those human beings. And it is institutionalized uh, through a rule of law by constitutional provisions that prevent uh, the excessive power 
uh, of the state uh, to limit um, individual choice. Uh, it's not necessarily associated with a particular economic ideology, except that it does protect private property rights. And so you can have an expansive social democratic government like in Sweden or Denmark, or you can have a more limited one like in the United States. And those are all, uh, I would say, liberal societies because of that commitment to rule of law. However, uh, liberalism has been very severely threatened in recent years. Um, it's been threatened from a number of sources. So internationally, you have two great powers, Russia and China, that are definitely not liberal uh, polities uh, that have expansive uh, ambitions. And as Vladimir Putin said back in an interview with the FT in 2019, liberalism is an obsolete uh, doctrine. But the threat, I think, also comes from other places as well. You have a, 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 the rise of a populist nationalist right in many countries. This is Viktor Orban in Hungary. This is Narendra, Narendra Modi in India, uh, Donald Trump in the United States, you know, Marine Le Pen in France, all of them criticizing uh, liberalism precisely for the tolerance that it uh, permits and, and tries to deal with uh, in diverse, increasingly ethnically and racially uh, diverse uh, countries. It's also been attacked from the left by people that, you know, I, I teach uh, uh, students at Stanford, and many of them think that liberalism is really the doctrine of their parents or their grandparents' generation, but it's really not uh, relevant to uh, Gen Z younger people who are impatient for social justice and social change that liberalism is not providing. All right, so that's, I think, the, the crisis, the number of liberal democracies measured by uh, uh, the organization Freedom House and its annual survey of freedom around the world has been in decline for 16 straight years. And the biggest declines recently have been in the two biggest liberal democracies, India and the United States. So there's, um, we've, we're dealing with a big global problem. So let me start by just going back to basics and explaining why liberalism is a desirable form of government or set of ideas to live under. And there's basically uh, three reasons. One is practical, uh, one is moral, and one is economic. The practical reason has to do with that original purpose of liberalism, which was to lower the temperature of politics by taking final ends off the table uh, and allowing societies to govern themselves when they face religious or national diversity. And that remains one of its biggest selling points. In India, uh, the republic that was created by Gandhi and Nehru was a liberal republic. They did not define themselves in religious terms. They knew that they had to deal with the incredible diversity, not just religious, but in terms of caste, region, language, uh, many other dimensions. Uh, and a liberal republic was really the only way of accommodating that diversity. What Prime Minister Modi is seeking to do right now is to shift that national identity to one based on Hindu nationalism, which then excludes the up to 200 million Muslims that live in contemporary India, as well as, you know, uh, Parsis, Christians, other people that are not uh, Hindu. When he was the chief minister in Gujarat, this led to communal riots, and I'm afraid that India is moving towards that kind of communal violence uh, once again uh, today. All right, so that's the pragmatic reason. The second reason has to do with the moral basis, which is the protection of human autonomy. Uh, you know, if you ask, in what sense could a liberal believe that all people are equal when they differ by skin color, by gender, by <clears throat> intelligence, by many other characteristics? The answer, I think, goes back to a fundamental insight that in, in a way, is, is stated in the, in the book of Genesis in the Bible, you know, that Adam and Eve uh, are told not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil by God and they disobey him. 
uh, they eat of the fruit and then that original sin leads to their being cast out of the garden. But it gives human beings a moral status that other parts of created nature don't have. They can make moral choices. They can distinguish between right and wrong. And it is that ability to choose uh, morally that ultimately is what makes us all equal because we share that despite the more superficial differences between people. And it's that right of autonomy. That is to say, you know, the decisions on what to do in life, where to live, who to marry, uh, what beliefs to, to uh, engage in. Uh, these are all essential characteristics of every human being that every human being wants. And a liberal uh, regime protects that autonomy. Then finally, uh, there's a good economic reason for choosing a liberal society because among the rights that liberalism protects is the right to own private property, to transact, to engage in uh, commerce, and therefore it is the basis of a market uh, economy. Liberal societies like um, uh, England and the Netherlands in the 17th century were the leaders in terms of creating the modern economic world precisely because uh, they respected uh, uh, property rights and, and trade. Um, even communist China, when it opened up in 1979-78, um, did so by adopting certain liberal principles. Deng Xiaoping allowed peasants to keep the fruits of their labor. And as a result of those uh, incentives, uh, quasi-property rights, agricultural productivity doubled in the space of four years. And in general, the most dynamic parts of this amazing Chinese growth story come from the private sector where people are allowed to buy and sell and to own, in effect, to own uh, property. So even in a illiberal, a politically illiberal society, uh, economic liberalism has led to a tremendous prosperity. So those are the those are the three reasons. Now, the argument that I make in my book is that part of the current disaffection with liberalism is not from any of its basic principles, but really is the result of certain deformations of liberal principles that were carried to extremes that led them to bad outcomes. And there is a move in this direction on the right and a move in this direction on the left. The one on the right concerned the shift from uh, an older understanding of economic liberalism to what is now called neoliberalism. Neoliberalism is not, in my view, a synonym for capitalism. I, I don't see how you can have any kind of modern economy without uh, a market-based economy. Neoliberalism took that basic insight and stretched it to an extreme, uh, seeking to deregulate, privatize, and basically pull back the role of the state, which many neoliberals regarded as simply obstacles to uh, individuals, to entrepreneurship, to economic growth. Uh, and as a result, uh, markets did their usual work. Uh, they produced a great deal of inequality as you know, global corporations searched for very small cost advantages by moving jobs to uh, low cost areas. And um, they destabilized the global economy in certain important ways by deregulating the financial sector. As a result of the deregulation that occurred in the 1980s and 90s, we had an escalating series of financial crises uh, in the, the Sterling crisis, the Asian financial crisis, Argentina, Russia, and finally culminating in the big American uh, subprime uh, crisis in 2008. The cumulative effects uh, of this instability were political and they were very serious because many ordinary people were hurt uh, by this instability. A lot of people lost their homes, lost their jobs, and the elites that ran these big banks and financial institutions suffered only a momentary disruption uh, in their incomes and went on to continue to uh, dominate the, uh, their respective economies. And I think that this had a direct impact on the rise of populism uh, 
in subsequent years, both on the right uh, and on the left. On the left, you had a different aspect of individual autonomy that was pushed to an extreme, which really had to do with the autonomy that individuals have to create their own uh, lifestyles. So as I said, you know, the basic concept of liberal autonomy has to do with your ability to make moral choices. But as time went on, the um, emphasis came to be not on making the right moral choices within an existing moral framework, but rather to be able to make up that framework uh, on your own, uh, that that was the ultimate expression uh, of individual human freedom. And it has obvious problems for a society because all societies have to be based on shared norms that allow people to coordinate their actions, to communicate uh, and the like. Uh, and if you believe that the rules can be really set by anybody and that transgressing existing rules is automatically a good thing, you're not going to have much of a stable society. There was moreover an attack on the individualistic premise that underlies liberalism through a uh, new kind of identity politics. Um, there is a liberal form of identity politics that says that liberalism does not live up to its promises of the equal treatment of individuals. So, you know, black people, other racial minorities, women, uh, LGBTQ people have been marginalized and excluded from participation, full participation uh, in the promise of a liberal rule, uh, rule of law. Uh, and identity politics was simply a means of mobilizing people and getting them to push for their inclusion. So that's a liberal and I think perfectly acceptable, in fact, desirable understanding of identity. But there was another, um, another view that's grown up very powerfully, especially in the Anglo-Saxon world, you know, places like uh, uh, the United States or Britain or Australia, where uh, identity politics is seen as a, an attack fundamentally on the individualistic premise of liberalism. That is to say, um, individuals are not really free. They're determined by the, the categories, the racial, uh, gender, and other categories into which they are born, and that the society needs to respect not what they do and decide as individuals, but to look first to that category, the racial, ethnic, gender category, and use that as a means of determining, you know, the distribution of resources, hiring, uh, promotion, uh, the other goods that society offers. And that, I think, is fundamentally uh, illiberal. It divides the society, uh, which it previously been held together through a set of, you know, common uh, values shared by individuals into uh, a society of groups. And at the end of that process, uh, you can ultimately end up with a place like Lebanon or Bosnia, where uh, identity politics really defines the whole of politics. Uh, and there is a kind of effort to move uh, uh, our modern liberal democratic politics in that kind of uh, identity-based direction uh, coming out of the contemporary left. Now, a further threat to liberalism has to do with uh, the mode of cognition that we call modern natural science. The, um, the early liberals uh, were very closely aligned with the founders of modern natural science, people like Bacon and Descartes and Newton, who uh, believe that there is an objective world beyond our subjective consciousnesses, that we could perceive this uh, world uh, through the experimental method and then come to manipulate it. Natural science gave us technology and it was that technology that made the world uh, much more habitable by conquering the disease, by uh, inventing things that vastly increased human productivity. So it's, it's closely related to the wealth and the, uh, the really the safety and comfort of uh, a modern uh, economically developed uh, uh, world. The attack on modern natural science has come from a number of sources. 
uh, in recent years. In my view, it starts really on the left with uh, a series of intellectual developments, you know, French structuralism that then develops into post-structuralism, post-modernism, uh, and ultimately into different varieties of uh, contemporary critical theory. The premise of which is that there's basically a subjectivity in the way that we perceive the world. We don't so much perceive an objective reality as impose reality on the world through the words that we use. Um, this really culminates, I think, in the thought of Michel Foucault. He's a very brilliant uh, philosophical observer, but he began to argue that actually modern science is not an objective uh, cognitive technique. It is really something that uh, elites use to manipulate people uh, so that in previous years, they could simply order the death of one of their subjects, but now they use science and the authority that science carries to convince people of certain things that are essentially a way of holding power over them. And he applies this to things like incarceration, homosexuality, uh, mental illness uh, and the like, but by the end of his career had really uh, broadened the idea of biopower to uh, really include much of what we understand to be modern natural science. And so the skepticism of science really starts uh, on the progressive left. It is now completely moved over to the nationalist populist right. So during the COVID epidemic, and I think up to the present moment, uh, there are many people on the extreme right around the world that, you know, for example, argue just like Foucault that what the public health authorities are telling you about vaccines or about masking is really not based on objective science. It's based on their, the, the elite desire to manipulate you. And it's really a game about power uh, rather than uh, about the truth. You combine that with the internet and the new digital technologies that have wiped away all of the former gatekeepers uh, like the traditional media um, or you know, other credible sources of scientific information uh, that used to certify information. Uh, you combine that with a principled belief that there really is no such thing as objective truth and you get the situation we now face ourselves uh, in or we now face uh, in which, uh, at least in the United States, you know, we can't agree on whether vaccines are safe, whether, uh, you know, who is the winner of the 2020 presidential election uh, and the like. And obviously, in a liberal society, you're not going to agree on the deepest, you know, moral uh, frameworks, but you are going to agree on factual information. And in fact, if you can't agree on factual information, it's very hard to deliberate in common, you know, what needs to be done in the future. Uh, and that's the situation we now face. Final thing I'll just say has to do with the question of the nation and the role of the nation in liberalism, because there would seem to be a tension between liberalism's belief that all human beings enjoyed, you know, the same basic set of human rights and the fact that we are divided up into uh, nation states in which the authority uh, to enforce those rights uh, is territorially limited. Uh, I think that this contradiction can be bridged uh, because I do believe that there is a liberal form of national identity, which is not only possible, but in fact necessary if a liberal society is going to uh, succeed. Um, a right uh, exists in theory, you know, human being, all human beings have the same set of rights, but rights need to be enforced by a state. It needs to rely on the coercive power uh, of a state. That is to say its army, its police force to actually make those rights uh, something real that citizens can enjoy. And the enforcement power is not uh, uh, universal. And in fact, we wouldn't want to live in a world in which every liberal state wanted to enforce liberal rights in every other state uh, in the world. The other big issue is an emotional one. We tend to feel the greatest bonds of solidarity with people that are close to us. 
uh, there are very few true citizens of the world. Uh, we're citizens of individual countries and we really feel um, the closest bonds to people that live within our nation. And therefore, you know, the nation becomes a kind of social glue. But if you're going to make uh, national identity compatible with liberalism, it has to be the right kind of national identity. It has to be one that is open to all of the citizens that actually live in the territory of the nation. It can't exclude certain groups by race, by ethnicity, by religious belief uh, and the like. Uh, and therefore, uh, it needs to be an open identity that is based on uh, essentially uh, liberal ideas. So this is something you know we see happening right now in the war in Ukraine. A lot of people raise the question, why are Ukrainians resisting the Russian invasion as ferociously as they are? And there's been a little bit of a debate over whether this is due to the fact that uh, uh, Ukraine is democratic, a liberal democracy, and, and Russia is not, or whether it's simply a fight over sovereignty. And I think that that's a false uh, dichotomy because you really don't fight for an liberalism as an abstract principle. You fight for it as it is embedded in a specific nation, that is to say your nation. And you know, from my rather uh, frequent visits to Ukraine over the last few years, I believe that that's really what's going on, that Ukrainians want their sovereignty, but the reason they want it so desperately is that they want to have a free Ukraine uh, and not Putin's Ukraine, not a dictatorship, a centralized dictatorship, and that's why they're willing to fight so tenaciously. So just to conclude, you know, I, I think it's appropriate to conclude with the invasion because I think that it exhibits in stark uh, terms the choice that is before us today between maintaining a liberal government that respects the rights of individuals uh, or uh, moving over to a form of centralized illiberal dictatorship, um, even if that dictate, well, that illiberal government is somehow democratically uh, legitimated. I think that's the central issue in global politics today. I think that's basically what the uh, Ukraine war, the Ukraine invasion is about. And that's why I think that all liberal societies uh, that care about those individual freedoms actually have a very powerful interest in the outcome of that war because Putin and Russia are at the center of an international network of illiberal uh, forces that are seeking to overturn liberal values in virtually every part of the world. And therefore, you know, that's all part of a larger global struggle over, you know, our fundamental liberal values. So with that, I'll stop talking and I look forward to uh, questions in a, in a discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Frank, for um, uh, giving us everything that we expected from you, which is uh, a, a, a very great lot. Um, your summary of um, the situation we are in today um, in regard to liberalism, um, the fact that um, over the past, say, 20 years has been, if anything, um, a decline in uh, liberally oriented uh, states in the sense in which uh, you define liberalism, um, and that it has come under uh, threat from both the right and the left, uh, from the right in the form of uh, neoliberalism, which uh, grossly exaggerates certain trends in uh, liberal thought, and from the left in the form of, um, first of all, um, a, a great emphasis, an excessive emphasis on identity, um, and uh, also uh, the um, questioning of the, the scientific method, which you rightly say uh, was uh, coeval with the rise of liberalism, um, you also mentioned uh, the um, events in the Ukraine, uh, which I think uh, throw a big stone in the pool uh, that we all contemplated only six months ago with all the problems that none of us expected. 
uh, that in, in Europe, uh, there would be um, a military invasion of one uh, nation by another. Uh, we have a lot of questions. Um, maybe I can take some of them. Um, one from um, Andy McGuire of the Technical University in Dublin, uh, who asks, uh, does Dr. Fukuyama believe in global terms, do societies need to move towards a, a post-abundance mindset? And if so, does he have thoughts on how might li liberalism best organize itself to most effectively fit this change? Uh, and this chimes with um, a, uh, a uh, locus in your book, which uh, struck me, and I wondered a bit about it. Uh, you said that growth uh, remains a necessary precondition for most of the other good things that societies seek. Um, I think in 2022, um, the, the concept of growth um, has become a bit questionable. Um, you know, it, it really isn't conceivable that we can foresee um, a, a, an era of uh, interminable growth. We are seeing limits to growth. Uh, sure. So I think that it's true that if growth occurs the way it has through the 19th and 20th centuries, that um, you know, as a result of carbon emissions and global warming, uh, it's not going to be a sustainable system. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that the idea that uh, countries are voluntarily going to give up the idea and the aspiration for abundance is politically extremely naive. Uh, I, you know, it's, it's simply not going to happen uh, for quite a lot of reasons. I mean, for one thing, uh, you know, growth is what allows uh, existing societies to get along with each other because growth is never equally distributed. Uh, but, you know, what keeps people believing in the legitimacy of the system is that uh, in, in good periods, everybody has participated in it. Um, the other, so the, you know, so what needs to change? There are several things. First of all, the character of out, the output uh, needs to change very much. Um, you know, we're in the process of decarbonizing the economy by shifting to, um, you know, sources of energy that do not produce uh, emissions. The economy as a whole is shifting to the production, not so much of material goods, but of services, which, you know, do consume energy, but, uh, you know, not at the same rate uh, as traditional growth. Then finally, I imagine that there are, uh, uh, you know, many things that we need to do to adapt to climate change as well as to mitigate it that actually require a lot of resources. You know, the estimates for decarbonizing energy in the globe, global economy today run into the trillions of dollars as we go to, you know, alternatives, where's that money going to come from, you know, if we simply decide that we're not going to grow anymore. Um, the other thing is a real equity issue, which has to do with the developing world. So the IMF estimates that by the middle of the 21st century, um, uh, the developed world is only going to be contributing something under 20% of global carbon emissions. 40% of new emissions by that time are going to come from China and then another maybe 20%, 15 to 20% from India and then the rest from other developing uh, countries. Uh, so when you say post abundance, does that apply to these countries uh, as, a, as well that constitute, you know, 80% of the emissions that are happening? Are we going to tell poor countries, you know, in Africa and Asia, Latin America, well, sorry, you know, you're going to have to be happy with the abundance that you have now. You're never going to be developed countries. Even if that were morally possible to do, politically, it's not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. Uh, and so I think that we need to look to different ways of shifting uh, growth, you know, onto a path that is more sustainable 
and a lot of that will involve technology, it'll involve building things to adapt uh, uh, and the like. Yeah, a couple of questions um, which have to do with um, the possibility of um, uh, coming, uh, let's say, the, the um, classical liberal it's coming to terms with those that don't meet these criteria. Um, Hiroaki Nakanishi, who is a member of the uh, LDP of Japan, um, asks, is it theoretically possible to establish a strategic relationship of indispensability with non-liberal stroke democratic entities so as to prevent war, uh, coercion or conflict? And Kian Fitzgerald, um, who is a foreign policy researcher at the Institute has a similar kind of question um, asking, is it possible to build a foundation uh, on the basis of a universal uh, understanding of human dignity? In other words, can East meet West? <clears throat> well, uh, to begin with the second question, uh, I don't think that that's possible because there really are very, you know, everybody around the world uses the uh, word dignity, but uh, it's it has different meanings in different societies. And so when the Chinese talk about the preservation of dignity, they're almost always thinking about some form of collective dignity, mm -hmm. not the dignity of individuals that liberal societies try to protect, but, you know, national sovereignty or the, you know, the well-being of the Chinese people. And these really are very, very different uh, concepts because in China, you know, the value of an individual's dignity is much lower than it is in a Western uh, liberal society. They don't respect the rights of individuals and are frequently willing to sacrifice them to, um, you know, to some kind of collective uh, interest. And, you know, and of course, there are much worse countries than China in terms of disrespecting uh, individual rights. Uh, and therefore, I don't think there's ever going to be uh, a kind of universal uh, consensus around, uh, you know, a shared understanding of dignity. What we can hope for is that, you know, the larger countries of the world uh, will agree on a fundamentally liberal uh, framework and that that will be enough to keep the peace and to, you know, build prosperity uh, and the like. It looked like we were on the way to doing that in the 1990s and the early 2000s, but it's that process that's gone into uh, reverse on the question of you know peace and and what liberal societies need to do when dealing with illiberal ones it really depends on the nature of that illiberal society uh, you know there are many illiberal states that basically have no foreign ambitions you know they don't want to uh, dominate the world or dominate the international system but there are other illiberal states that uh, whose national identity is basically inextricably bound up with the idea of domination. And I'm afraid that that's what you're dealing with in the case of Russia right now. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Putin has made it really clear that although he's complained about NATO expansion and, and, and what he perceives as security threats to Russia, you know, his real uh, his real source of unhappiness is what happened in 1991, the falling apart of the former Soviet Union. And he would like to reassert control over as much of not just the former Soviet Union, but of the former Warsaw Pact countries uh, as possible. And given that, you know, he doesn't really face any constraints at home, uh, I think trying to coexist with him, you know, like <clears throat> there have been a lot of calls in, in recent, in the last couple of weeks that Ukraine needs to give up territory in order to get peace with Russia. But I don't think that's gonna solve the problem because the Russians will use that uh, as a means of recuperating from their early losses. And they will then go be back at the business of threatening uh, others, uh, neighbors of theirs, including continuing to threaten Ukraine. And so I don't think that you're actually going to get to peace by that route. Whereas with other states, you know, uh, you can work with countries that differ very greatly that are not liberal uh, if they don't have that 
you know, expansive sense of national identity. So <clears throat> I think the, you know, the decision on, on whether to negotiate really hinges on factors like that. Um, a question from Bobby McDonald, former uh, Irish ambassador to the UK. Um, how optimistic are you that liberalism can survive and thrive? Um, can the EU, the European Union, play a significant part uh, in that direction? Well, the EU has already played a significant role in spreading liberal ideas. It's based on a real liberal notion uh, of the internal market and the freedom of the internal market, freedom of movement. Uh, it, its membership criteria require respect for the rule of law, uh, strong liberal institutions. And so it's been the accession process has actually been one of the, you know, probably the most effective ways of projecting liberal values and institutions into other parts of the world. And, you know, they've been um, the, the new entrants uh, that entered after 91 have been under the gun to uh, reform their institutions in a liberal direction because of the uh, attractiveness of joining the EU. The EU's problem is a little bit different. Um, it's a great membership club, uh, but it has no way of kicking members out or disciplining them when they get uh, unruly and stop, stop obeying the rules of the club. And that's the situation uh, you really have right now with Hungary, which has thumbed its nose at a lot of the um, well, it's thumbed its nose at the EU itself, um, but also at the principles of rule of law underlying the European Union and the EU, because it depends on consensus decision making, really hasn't been able to do much, you know, to stop it. I hope that, you know, some of the solidarity funds now that the EU has promised its members, um, you know, if they if they have qualified majority voting, uh, in the distribution of those funds, that it may actually be possible to withhold them from a country like Hungary that is being highly disruptive, you know, of the consensus among the other uh, EU members uh, and, you know, indicate that there are some costs to not uh, living up to uh, European standards. But up till now, unfortunately, that mechanism doesn't really exist. And you could say um, um, it's also a state which prides itself on being an illiberal democracy. Well, that's what Viktor Orban has said, uh, you know, explicitly, right? Yes. Um, two questions together, if I may. Uh, first from Bill Emmett, uh, who is a former editor of The Economist. Uh, he says, given the US Republican Party's embrace of the idea uh, that the uh, election, uh, the 2020 was stolen, and its acceptance of the January 6th assault as legitimate political discourse, does this mean that one of the two dominant parties in the US has chosen to reject rule of law based liberal democracy? Where do you think this will lead in 2024 and beyond? And the second question is on the same subject from Willem No, economic counselor at the European Commission office in Ireland. In the current US, uh, there does not seem to be any quote left unquote politics, only shades of extreme right and right. Do you still think that democracy in the US is salvageable? Oh yeah, well, I think certainly think it's salvageable, but it's under severe threat. Um, and I think it's correct as Bill Emmett uh, suggested that the Republican Party has really gone off the rails and has become, you know, in many ways a quasi authoritarian party because many Republicans are not willing to accept the um, results of a, you know, a free and fair election. Uh, I think that we've learned a lot uh, from the committee, the House committee that's studying the January 6th uh, insurrection. And what that committee has revealed was that this wasn't just a demonstration that spontaneously got out of hand. It was planned very deliberately by the White House uh, as a way of pressuring uh, former Vice President Pence to overturn uh, the election and keep Donald Trump in office. And right now, a lot of uh, state level Republican legislatures are trying to modify their uh, 
uh, rules for counting votes in the next election so that they would be in a better position to do what they tried to do in 2020 but didn't get away with. And so this is probably the most severe threat to American democracy that has come up really since the Civil War in the middle of the 19th uh, century. And I'm quite worried about that. Uh, you know, with regard to the question of the survival of American democracy, I think that there is still a, you know, pretty overwhelming consensus in favor of existing democratic institutions in the United States. You know, the uh, right wing Republicans that support Donald Trump don't really constitute, they may be a majority within the Republican Party, but overall, they're not really more than about 30% of the whole electorate. And you do still have quite a big group in the middle that um, are not ardent Trump supporters. You know, they live in these swing states that will decide the next uh, election, but they also feel that the Democrats aren't giving them much of a, you know, uh, much of an alternative because uh, President Biden, you know, was initially elected as a, a kind of normal alternative to Trump and among the Democrats running was seen as the most centrist and moderate. But ever since he got elected, he's been governing, you know, from a much more progressive, uh, you know, left wing position. And I think that as a result, a lot of those centrist voters have been turned off. And, you know, I, I, I know this from friends of mine that are conservative that, you know, they, they don't like Trump, but they also don't like the Democrats and they dislike the Democrats to the point where they're consider, they'd consider voting for uh, uh, another Trump uh, candidacy. Uh, and that's very dangerous. Uh, uh, I think that, um, you know, we need a good alternative to Trumpism. There is a majority in favor of that, but, you know, the other party is really not providing that alternative in a, in a very uh, clear way. Yeah, uh, we have another question here, which uh, speaks to uh, precisely what you just said from <clears throat> Mark Coleman. Um, he asked, does Professor Fukuyama accept that the dominance in the media of one side of the debate, largely liberalism in a partisan sense, uh, the Democratic Party in the US <clears throat> is undermining the confidence of some voters <clears throat> in the fairness of the democratic game does this create resentment that forces more moderate conservative voters in, to turn to the far right in desperation rather than conviction? I think it speaks to what you've just been talking yeah. about. Yeah. Well, look, as an empirical matter, that's certainly happening. <coughs> you know, the mainstream media does have a liberal bias, as does, you know, a lot of higher education, academia, you know, and so forth. Uh, and uh, a lot of people see that and they don't like it. Uh, you know, the problem is that um, the solution that is being offered by the extreme right is, you know, is really a lot worse uh, because, well, first of all, the critics of the mainstream media don't actually appreciate the fact that there is diversity in that, you know, and that um, there are actually journalistic standards that, you know, the New York Times and the Washington Post continue to adhere to, all of which uh, is being tossed out the window on the far right, uh, you know, in, in reaction to the perceived bias. The other thing is that there's a difference between bias and outright, um, you know, lying. Uh, so the bias really has to do with what kinds of stories are covered, uh, you know, the kinds of slant that's given to the reporting on, on different um, things that happen. Uh, but what's going on in large sections of the conservative media is just outright, you know, untruth, you know, that, that uh, people will just make up facts uh, and, you know, without sourcing them properly, just present them to, to viewers. And uh, that's another sense in which I think, you know, the solution is a lot worse than the, you know, the underlying, uh, the underlying disease. Uh, so yes, I do believe that that is what's driving a lot of people away from the mainstream media. Uh, but I think that what we need is a, you know, responsible uh, uh, right-wing media that, you know, does adhere to certain basic journalistic standards. And basically, 
you know, there's a tendency on the part of everybody to, you know, take particular anecdotes and instances of abuse and then generalize it to say that, you know, the entire media universe is corrupt because of, you know, one particular story without, you know, really appreciating the fact that, you know, that's not a universal uh, problem. Yeah, and of course, the, the social media uh, come in on top of this, um, and you have, you know, channels like QAnon, which, um, um, which uh, disseminate um, things that to uh, any ordinary intelligence are simply unbelievable, but um, astoundingly are um, believed in by even members of Congress. Yeah, that's right. And there seem to be no guardrails on that sort of thing. So uh, you have, you know, elected politicians that will repeat these, you know, including a woman that, you know, maybe the next uh, uh, House whip in, in, in the House of Representatives who, you know, basically charged uh, most Democrats with being pedophiles. I mean, it's, it's, it's a kind of ridiculous degradation of the kind of political rhetoric that uh, our leaders are using. Yeah. Uh, to come to the economic side of it, a question from Dan O'Brien, who is a chief economist in the Institute, uh, who asks, is there a tendency to overstate economic factors in the rise of nativist populism? In many European countries, the Nordics in particular, there have been few losers from globalization, and the state's welfare safety net remains very comprehensive. Yet, even here, populist parties have gained ground. Oh, yeah, I, I, I think that um, culture is a much uh, better predictor of populist uh, sentiment than economics. You know, the average Trump voter in 2016 had a higher per capita income than the average Hillary Clinton voter. Uh, and if you look at the people in the January 6th riot, you know, the vast majority of them were comfortable middle class people with good jobs and, and, and so forth. And so I think that there is a core, you know, kind of white working class base to to Trumpism. But, you know, a lot of the people that are aligned with that movement are there for cultural reasons. They really don't like uh, the kind of identity politics that's being you know, put forward by the progressive left. Uh, you know, a lot of Hispanic voters, for example, uh, don't like socialism and they don't like the fact that the Democrats are using the word socialism as if it's a you know perfectly normal set of uh, economic choices. What's interesting about the world today is that the fundamental division is really a kind of sociological one between people that have better educations that live in big urban agglomerations that then can benefit from uh, you know, a, a global economy uh, versus people that live in top, smaller cities and towns or in the countryside, you know, with more traditional values. That division is, exists almost universally in, in Turkey and Hungary and the United States and Britain. Um, and, you know, it reflects, I think, um, it does reflect different economic opportunities, but more fundamentally, I think it reflects a, a certain way of life that, you know, in the in the urban case is fundamentally liberal and open, uh, but in some cases, you know, uh, people would say a little bit too open and too tolerant of, you know, people that want to break uh, traditional norms that are still maintained by you know other parts of the population. So it's really that cultural fight I think that's at the at the center of populism. Uh, related to economic inequality, but certainly not fundamentally driven by economic inequality. Um, we can turn to, to Russia for a moment. Uh, we have a question from Claudius Kozhevsky of the Polish embassy, uh, who asks, uh, how do you see Russia now after 30 years after Glasnost and Perestroika? Um, is there still a prospect of uh, movement towards uh, liberalism and democracy, or have they reverted uh, uh, finally uh, to the classical Russian pattern of 
the, the strong Tsar who dominates the system? It's a, it's a big question. Well, yeah, I think, unfortunately, the, the latter is really where the Russians are heading. I mean, there was a liberal opposition in the 1990s that's gradually gotten squeezed out. I mean, they're literally now either in jail like Alexei Navalny or they're, um, uh, they've been forced out of the country. And I think that the prospect of a liberal Russia returning right now is extremely low. Uh, you know, maybe if the Ukrainians really win this war and humiliate P Putin, uh, there may be some internal, you know, shuffling among uh, existing Russian elites. But if you look at, uh, you know, um, poll data and, you know, what passes for public opinion in Russia, you know, a lot of people have been supporting the war. Uh, and, you know, it's it's interesting even Russians living outside of Russia in other parts of Europe that have access to good information um, about what Russia is doing to Ukraine, even a lot of those people support uh, Putin. And so I'm afraid that, you know, this older form of Slavophilism uh, that was very powerful in the 19th century hasn't uh, disappeared. And, you know, it has certainly gotten reinforced under Putin in recent years that Russia can't be Russia unless it dominates, you know, the smaller countries uh, around its periphery. And I don't see that changing anytime, uh, you know, in the near future. Well, I suppose you could say the same about um, China. And um, when you speak of China, you speak of uh, one fifth of the population of the globe. Um, um, there doesn't seem to be any great prospect for uh, an expansion of the sphere of liberalism or liberalism in the sense that you and I would uh, define it in the world today. Well, not at the moment. I, I do think that there are real problems with the China model. Uh, you know, this one man decision making that uh, they've now moved into. Uh, whose downside you can really see in the zero COVID policy that they've maintained, you know, in spite of, uh, you know, the cost that uh, that it's imposing on, on China's population. But I don't think that that's going to lead to instability or any changes uh, in the regime. The one thing you'd have to say for China is that their leadership is more risk averse than is Putin. You know, Putin has been this huge risk taker uh, in the course of his career and done all sorts of things that, for example, the Soviet leadership was never willing to do, like send troops directly to the Middle East uh, to intervene in a Middle Eastern conflict. China, I think, is more cautious. And in a way, that makes them more dangerous because they're not going to rush headlong into kind of harebrained, you know, schemes like, like Putin has. Um, uh, they're going to bide their time and they, you know, they don't want to be overly disruptive, but, um, but they are going to definitely be a big challenge and I don't expect them to disappear anytime in the near future either. A final question from Donald Obolkhan, who is a member of the Institute on the question of identity. Um, he asks, what kinds of institutions uh, can be conceived of that serve that basic human need? Uh, how can we enhance institutions so that identity is grounded uh, in the practical, moral, and economic mode of liberalism? Well, look, I think that identity is something that is universally uh, desired by people. In a liberal society, we say that people can associate based on you know all sorts of identity uh, affiliations um, and that they're free to do so in a kind of voluntary civil society i think the danger really resides when the state begins to endorse uh, identity categories as sort of fixed categories and then to distribute resources or you know access to institutions on the basis of those fixed categories uh, that's the point at which I think you risk really hardening uh, these notions of identity into self-regarding groups that are living next to each other, you know, well, okay, I'll give you a very uh, 
a specific example of this in the UK, uh, you get state supported religious schools, you know, for Jews, for Muslims, for, uh, you know, people of other faiths, people should be free in a liberal society to set up private schools to if they want to bring up people in a religious tradition, I don't really see why the state ought to be supporting that because what you don't want to do is to have people, young people educated in closed communities where they have nothing to do with people from other communities. I mean, that's fundamentally illiberal. And I think that's, you know, that's a mistaken policy that's actually going to harden those divisions rather than to encourage a more you know, open and tolerant society. Yes, uh, you would find the same feature in this country, uh, Frank. Um, a system that was established under British rule in the 19th century. Uh, we thank you very much for the spirit in which you uh, approach this, um, Professor Fukuyama. I think we have been very enriched by your presentation which um, is the culmination, uh, as I said at the beginning, of uh, 33 years of engagement with uh, these big questions, which are so important for us all. Um, my apologies to uh, the many questioners that um, I couldn't reach within the time scale, uh, but I think uh, you covered uh, quite a lot also in the answers to the questions. Uh, we thank you for being with us. Uh, we look forward to having you again, um, and we would like to hope that we will be able to meet you in due course in Dublin. Okay, thank you very, very much for having me.